So thanks to everybody for joining today. What I'll be talking about is my experience applying ChatGPT4 as a static code analysis tool. And we'll talk about this, and I'll give you some examples in the context of how I'm using this to help review my programming assignments at Vanderbilt. However, I think you'll quickly recognize that the technique that I'm describing clearly generalizes to many other contexts, such as the other kinds of work that we typically do with reviewing code of partners and sponsors and customers, as well as code that we may write ourselves. And of course, the other point here is we could also use a similar technique to analyze documents, and I'll touch on that a little bit towards the end. This particular use case that I'll be describing falls clearly within the scope of the Software Engineering Institute's National Software Agenda Study that you can see at the link below. Many of you have been involved with this. And in particular, this is the part that deals with having the use of AI augmented software development tools and methods, but we're building or analyzing conventional systems. Now, this particular diagram you see here is based on some work that I've been doing lately with EPEC and John Robert, but you'll see that you can get a broader view of this if you want to watch the videos that I've uploaded to my YouTube channel as per a course I taught yesterday at Vanderbilt. So if you take a look at the top items that are there right now, you'll see that there's part one, two, three, and four, although oddly enough, not in that order. And if you take a look at part one, it describes this diagram. And if you take a look at parts two and part three, they describe different pieces as well. And then part four, is me showing how to use ChatGPT to do some problem solving that was very effective without writing any code. It, I let ChatGPT generate the code and I just problem solve with it. So let's talk about the context of this work. What I'm trying to do and what I've been doing is applying generative AI at Vanderbilt. Now, as you all know, the barrier to entry for applying generative AI is very low. You just have to go out and log in and make an account on OpenAI or at Bard, at Google, or Claude, and you can start doing stuff. Now, what you get out of the box is somewhat limited. You get just a certain amount of capability. And if you want to get a little bit further along, you can pay 20 to 40 bucks a month, and you'll get access to more powerful tools. That's essentially a couple of cups of coffee at Starbucks. I found this funny photo of the mother of dragons from Game of Thrones, where she's got a Starbucks coffee cup on her table, showing that everybody's using coffee, even if they live in uh, fantasy lands. Another thing to note here, right up front, is that generative AI tools like ChatGPT and Claude and so on are not yet flawless. In fact, they may never be flawless. So you therefore have to adjust your expectations accordingly. However, there's a lot of gloom and doom coming out from some pretty well-known computer scientists, people like Bertrand Meyer, or Peter Denning, where they're saying outrageous things like AI does not help programmers or things along the lines of ChatGPT will fail at almost everything you give it and it's very simple-minded and it's repetitive and it says nothing new. I personally believe that these critiques are very much misplaced for several reasons. First, I don't think that these people are doing an effective job of prompt engineering, so they're not using the tools properly, number one. Number two, they're not thinking about how people actually apply these tools in practice. I'm using ChatGPT all the time to help me program more effectively, so I don't quite know where they're coming from with these bold statements that don't have any real depth to them. And third, I don't think they're using the right tools. So it turns out that the tools that you use make a big difference in what you get. And I'll talk about this later when we talk about the specifics of using ChatGPT4 as a static analysis tool. If you use it with the chat window, it works quite well. If you use it with the so-called advanced data analytics, which what used to be known as code interpreter, it doesn't work very well. So picking the right tools, using the tools of the right way, and thinking more coherently about how people actually program with these tools makes a big difference. In fact, I've coined a term which I refer to as degenerative AI, which are where people don't use the right tools, they don't use them the right way, they don't do prompt engineering, and then they throw up their hands and discuss and say, see, the emperor has no clothes. This stuff is flawed. It'll never be useful. Nothing could be further from the truth. However, I think it's also fair to say that if we want to get good results, we should think about AI in generative AI as meaning augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence. The idea is to supplement, not supplant the human. We need to work together to use these tools as an exoskeleton for your brain, as it were, 
And then they work out quite nicely. If you expect that they will work perfectly without trying to do any other human related activities and apply creativity and discipline, you will be sorely disappointed. But the good news is we can do much better. I've been applying what I call AI plus, which is this generative augmented intelligence in my courses at Vanderbilt, where I teach several courses on concurrent and parallel programming on a wide range of computing platforms, including mobile devices, laptops, clouds, and so on. You can find more information about these courses at the links at the bottom of the slide. For example, a course I taught last spring, which was the early days of ChatGPT, had students building a movie recommendation web app using both AI and non-AI parts, and also using AI software development techniques and traditional development techniques in order to make their assignments work properly. And that worked out really well. My overall goal in what I'm about to describe is to make my teaching and quite frankly, my research and my day-to-day -day life a lot more creative and a lot more fun while making me more effective at some of the things that aren't as much fun, but are still essential in my job, especially as a teacher. So I like to create and give lectures. I like to create and explain code. I like to write programming assignments. I like to review my students' code, but I don't like creating tests and quizzes and knowledge check questions. I always find that kind of mundane. I don't really like to grade my students' code after I have initially reviewed it. I let my TAs and graders do that. I don't like to have to figure out summarizations from the content in my lecture videos that I upload to Vanderbilt. So I'm using ChatGPT and generative AI to make those things less onerous and more fun and actually more accurate in many ways too. So let's talk about specifically one of the things that I'm doing here. So what I've discovered is I can use ChatGPT to help me in my work. Now, why am I concerned with this in the first place? Well, one of the problems that we're facing is that these tools that are out there now can trivially generate very accurate solutions to programming assignments if they are specified with enough detail. So for example, I've worked with a colleague who teaches our CS2201 data structures course, and we took one of his harder assignments that takes students weeks to do. We gave it to ChatGPT, and it was able to come up with a solution in a matter of minutes. Kind of a concern, right? Well, I thought that the fact that I'm teaching more advanced courses that have more complex topics, things like concurrency, parallel programming, microservices, networking, databases and so on, that my assignments would be immune from this regeneration, reverse engineering stuff. Well, it turned out to my horror when I started my course in the fall, just a few weeks ago, that when I gave the specifications to ChatGPT, it also quickly generated a solution that was pretty much spot on to my solution for my course. And this is an upper division course on complicated stuff with parallel function programming in Java. And that had the light bulb go off in my head. I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to take a step back and think about how to come up with assignments that are harder to reverse engineer. Well, the good news is that you could ask ChatGPT to do this. You can help it take your spec and generalize it so it's harder to reverse engineer. So to quote Job from the Old Testament, ChatGPT taketh away because it takes away the ability to give these detailed specs, but it also giveth because it will help us figure out how to reverse engineer things or re-engineer re our specifications. So they're harder to reverse engineer. So blessed be the name of ChatGPT. So I asked ChatGPT, once I gave it my spec, how could I do this in a way that would be harder for you to reverse engineer? And it came back and it gave me a bunch of suggestions. It said, emphasize problem solving over coding. Great in insight. Ask for explanations and design rationale. Break the assignment up into parts. Add an oral component where the students have to actually get up in front of the class and explain their solution. So it's harder for them to just fake it. What I decided to do in the spirit of what it was telling me was not give such detailed specs. Now, this was, this was good at one level, but it opened up a whole new can of worms. And the can of worms it opened up was it now became harder to generate the code with ChatGPT because the specs weren't as detailed, but it was also harder to assess the solutions that the students gave. What we have been doing up to this point was we were using white box testing and mocking in order to give people very detailed assessments of their code because we asked them to write the code in a fairly prescribed way. There's also issues, and, and of course, it's much harder to do that once you've generalized the spec. You're not as detailed. It's harder to white box test. It's harder to mock without giving lots of false mistakes that really aren't problems. It's just people being creative. 
The other problem we have is if we we go the opposite route and say, well, we'll we'll rely on an army of graders to review this stuff according to rubrics that I write down and give them. Now we've got a problem with what's known as inter-rater reliability, which is a problem that occurs in many different areas, for example, sporting events or uh, other places where you have to have many people review stuff like grant proposals or, or contract renewals and so on. When you have multiple graders and multiple TAs, not everybody will interpret the rubric the same way. So you'll have some people who grade easy, some people who grade hard, and we need to figure out some way to avoid those problems. Fortunately, we're going to come up with a solution, and the solution, as you might expect, is going to use a chat GPT as a static code analysis technique. And there's another benefit that comes from not having such highly prescribed specifications. It gives students the opportunity to be more creative in what they do and not lock them into the Procrustean bed of a one-size-fits-all, highly opinionated solution. So I think this is actually good at several different levels, but it's gonna take some work. So what I'm gonna describe now is what I've done to address this. So what I'm doing is I'm using augmented intelligence along with ChatGPT to improve the way that we review and revise programming assignments for my computer science courses. Now, before I talk about my solution, I have to explain the process because it's kind of unique. So what I do is I have a multi-stepped process for giving people assessment. And the first step involves everybody submitting their solution, their initial solution, and I review all the initial solutions. So I take a look at everybody's code and I write down the frequently made mistakes that I see over and over again in the code. Actually, I write down all the mistakes I see, but some of them are very common. And I put that into a file and then I make a video. And this video I call the frequently mistakes, frequently made mistakes video. And you can see it, you can see an example of it if you click on the link at the bottom of the slide. And this is really helpful. My students find it very useful. But the problem historically has been that it's just a file full of things that I know how to explain, but it's difficult for me to take this file and just hand it off to my TAs or graders because they don't always have as much experience as I do for what to look for and how to mark the results. So I'm kind of banking on the fact that students will do a perfect job and then my graders can come back and just run unit tests. But we know that doesn't work anymore because the unit tests are not able to capture all the problems because we've generalized the specs. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking this frequently made mistakes file and I'm describing the contents in the form of natural language queries. And these are, these are basically things I can train ChatGPT to do in order to automatically check for mistakes in the final solutions that my students submit. So they will resubmit their code after they address my comments. And then my graders and TAs will be unleashed on that code armed with my ChatGPT instance so they get much better feedback and they can interpret the rubric much more precisely. And they can still use human brains to make sure that we're not missing something, but it greatly streamlines the process and helps to automate a lot of the steps in reviewing these revised programming assignments. So how have we done this? Well, we ended up training ChatGPT to analyze student submissions for frequently made mistakes. And I'll show you how that works here in just a moment. But first, let me just make another interesting point. In this process that I used to come up with the way of doing this, I discovered something really interesting about large language models. They're great for iteratively improving themselves. So for example, here's an instance where I knew that there was something wrong with a piece of code, but ChatGPT wasn't getting it right the first time when I gave it the code to analyze. So rather than throw up my hands and do what the degenerative AI people do and say, it's see, the emperor has no clothes, this technology doesn't work, I asked ChatGPT some questions. I said, your answer to my question was incorrect. There, there was indeed a Java for loop, but not a traditional index-based for loop. You missed this. You gave me the wrong response. Please help me rephrase my question so you answer it correctly the first time. And because ChatGPT is very agreeable and very helpful, it said, sure, certainly. It then gave me a way to rephrase my question so it had more context. Large language models love context. The more context, the more accurate they typically are. Another great insight that is based only on using this stuff in practice and not just scoffing and throwing up your hands at the, the first sign of problems. So I was able to go back and improve things. So it was in fact able to find these things the first time henceforth. Good luck trying to get this behavior with your favorite static analysis tool 
or interactive development environment. Use your favorite static analysis tool with probably some specialized notation to look for certain things in the code. And if you don't get the query correct, you're not going to get the right results, but you're not going to be able to sit there and have a dialogue with your static analysis tool to try to help you figure out a better way to phrase the query. Same thing is true with your interactive development environment. If you're writing Java or C++ and you have problems, it'll tell you their problems, but it will make it difficult usually to interactively find out why those problems exist and how to fix them. And this ranges from syntax errors to semantic misconceptions to race conditions, memory visibility problems, and so on. You're not going to be able to converse with your IDE. So once again, this is a wonderful feature of things like ChatGPT, where you can actually have this dialogue. So what I'm going to do now in the second part of this video is we're going to actually walk through the use of ChatGPT in order to statically analyze code.